today the message is entitled, It is Dark, But Don't Stay There. It is dark, but don't stay there. Lord, we pray that the entry of your word will bring light. Lord, please take this message, give it to us in a way that resonates with our respective experiences and personalities. But at the end of the day, let us see Christ and let's be changed to be more like him. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. When the ark, when the ark rests on Mount Ararat in Genesis 8, that's from verse 4, the water continues to decrease. Noah makes the decision to open the window and he will let out two birds to assist with the process of researching about the terrain. He will let out a raven, a bird of prey. It eats flesh. It's actually, we call it a carrion feeder. It eats decomposing flesh. It's a very smart move considering the amount of dead material that is out there. By observing the behavior of the raven, Noah is able to tell how much dead material is still out there. And the raven kept just going back and forth. But he also releases a dove. A dove is, let me just use vegetarian, it's not a carrion feeder. And it's sent on multiple missions, and every time it comes back, Noah waits for a while before releasing it again. And eventually, based on the data he gets from observing the raven and the dove, Noah is able to progress. Now that's a part of the story we, we know. I'm a zoologist, that's what I'm trained in. So forgive me, there are things when I read in the Bible I question a bit differently. I'm not, I'm not a theologian. And so I didn't just ask, why choose a raven, why choose a dove? They made sense zoologically. But there's an animal that is missing in the choice list that captured more my attention. That's why I want us to examine something today. So just go with me to Genesis 3, and you begin understanding why I'm curious. Let's go today to Genesis 3. Let's take from where we've been and go to Genesis 3. I'm reading verse 1, from verse 1. This is what the Bible says. Now the serpent was more subtle than all the creatures of the field that the Lord God had made. Now that's a creature I was wondering why it couldn't be selected. A creature which is actually the first for us to be introduced to separately. And in its introduction we are told it was more subtle. Other versions will tell you it was wiser than all the creatures of the field. All. Just think of all the smart animals you know. The serpent is introduced in Genesis 3, verse 1, as being subtle than all of them. Now, I invite you to read the Bible with shared zoology eyes. We're reading Genesis 3, verse 1, continuing. And he said to the woman, Yeah, have the Lord God said that thou mayest not eat freely of the fruits of the trees in the garden? You notice immediately, as I did as a zoologist, this is not something we observe every day. This is a talking serpent. Now, I am Luya. If I came here with a talking cock for this morning, I came with a cock that is talking, and I have a conversation with it, I'm sure half of you would have departed from the room by then. But then I carry over the talking cock 
to one of your tables and say, can you have a conversation with it? You'll probably think me mad, a bully, or because you're African, you'll think, is this a normal cock? Because we know cocks don't talk, so we don't hold conversations with cocks. So you notice something very curious when you read Genesis 3. When you read verse 1, the serpent talks and asks a very cogent, very coherent question. Now notice what verse 2 does not say. Verse 2 does not say, and the woman responded and said, hey, since when did snakes start talking? That's all the Bible says. The woman actually responded back, and not once in this conversation. Let's read. And the woman replied and said, Nay, the Lord God did say we may freely eat of the fruits of the trees in the garden, but of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the Lord God did say we may not eat thereof nor touch lest we die. Thou shalt not surely die, the serpent said. This is a conversation. It's not a one wolf thing. So give me some liberty here. The fact that the woman is not shocked that the serpent is talking seems to suggest it was not out of the norm. Almost the same way a parrot owner is not shocked that the parrot is talking, it seems the parrot had the capability to talk. But Let's just zoom in a bit more on Genesis 3, the passages we've read so far. We're at verse 4. And you begin noticing other very interesting abilities. The serpent had good eyesight. How do I know that? Number one, it is able to tell that there are many trees in the garden. And it is able to distinguish certain trees. Number two, it is able to pick out the woman and speak specifically to the woman. It doesn't just speak to a random tree. It is not speaking to some zebra in a corner. It is speaking to the woman. It had good eyesight. The serpent had good hearing. How do I know? Because when the woman responds, the serpent is able to hear, process, and then Respond back. The serpent had the ability to talk. Speech is a very interesting thing. Air from my lungs is passing through my voice box, allowing it to vibrate at different frequencies and it manifests itself as sound. Now, any creature with a voice box and a set of lungs can be able to produce that kind of sound. But in the case of the story we are reading in Genesis 3, that sound was intelligible and intelligent. So just reading it again as a zoologist and not a theologian, I realized that this processes described in Genesis 3 to become possible, the snake at a bare minimum needed to have lungs, it needed to have a voice box, and it needed to possess some capacity of intelligence so that it does not just produce an understand, in understandable words, but that they are intelligent enough for the woman to be able to hold a conversation with it. When eventually the woman falls in sin and brings the man along with him and God begins intervening, this is what he says in verse 14. And to the serpent he said, Genesis 3, and to the serpent he said, because thou hast done this, cast at thou above all the creatures of the field, on thy belly shall thou crawl, and thou shalt eat dust all your days, and I will put enmity between 
you and the woman, and between your seed and the seed of the woman. Yeah, I see the theologians brightening up because there is a promise of the Messiah. But before we go there, allow the zoologist to lead for a moment. If I come to tell you, from today going forward, you will crawl, it means prior to that, you are not crawling. If I say from today going forward, you will walk on your belly, it means prior to that, you are not walking on your belly. You, pro you possessed a different method of locomotion. You probably will remember this message as the message that had that big word zoology. But let me again tap into zoology to assist here. There's a big word we use in zoology. It's called vestigial. Uh, we, we use such words to just make you feel we are smart. But what it really means is limbs or organs that are not used for some time or that once existed and are not there but have left something of traces or of marks or of scars that they once existed become something we call vestigial. It's an oversimplified way, but I hope it gets you the point. Now, in the labs, when we examine snakes, variety of snakes all over the world, what we realize is they have vestigial limbs. There are several species that have very clear indications that at some point in some time in the past, they possessed legs, places or sockets in their bodies that indicate this serpents in times past possessed legs. In some species that we find in the Amazon, we have even discovered what looks like vestigial wings. In fact, even at this moment in the Amazon are snakes that are called flying snakes, not because they possess literal wings, but they are able to adjust their body cavity when they fling themselves from one tree to another and they literally fly through the air. Something still about their anatomy allows them to perform that phenomenal feat of appearing to fly in mid-air. Ladies and gentlemen, stay with me for a minute. When we, however, examine snakes, this is something I keep trying to persuade my wife and she tells me, honey, this makes sense intellectually, but only there. Most snakes are basically blind. They don't see or don't see well. I, I see unbelief. I, I almost see that look that says, I, I ain't going to confirm that. I will not invest in confirming that. How they make sense of the environment is chiefly through two things. You see them poking out their tongue. That's how they sniff their environment. That's how they get data. What they are really doing is they are they're doing something almost like what a blind person does with a white cane. They are feeling out for their environment. That's why they keep poking out their tongue. Their eyes, for the most part, don't see too well. There are species of snake, don't be, don't be fooled, like the cobra that have exceptional eyesight, but most snakes do not see well. The second way they are able to tell about prey or enemies or anything is through the vibrations. Because they crawl on the ground, they listen to the vibrations that then go through their body. That's how they're able to make sense that a potential enemy or potential food is, is coming. The ears are buried under a thick layer of scales, and that is why rather than depending on them, they have to listen to the vibrations. Gone is the capacity to speak, and in its place is that scary or irritating hissing sound. And because the immediate audience is African, 
We don't ordinarily keep snakes as pets unless you want to be considered as being weird. No one will stone you for having a dog in your compound, at least in our culture, or a cat. In fact, we can even be tolerant if you have a pet sheep, but the word pet and snake do not conjoin in our cultures. A snake has become now replaced not as a sign of wisdom, but as a very sign of incarnate evil itself. Now all of that, let's apply it. What made the difference between it moving from the wisest, smartest land animal outside of man to this creature which elicits hate if not fear? The answer is one thing. Whom it chose to lend its abilities to. God stands and before he addresses the woman and before he addresses the man, he says, because thou has done this. The theologians will tell us that he is speaking to the devil who used the serpent as a medium. But allow the gospel to be advanced through the eyes of a zoologist. And my th simple thesis is this. That when the abilities of the serpent were in the hands of its creator, God, it was the most beautiful creature. It had the ability of speech. It possessed the ability to at bare minimum walk and strong suggestions that it could even fly. It had eyesight that was impeccable and had earring that was acute. It possessed lungs that took in air and let it out beautifully through the mechanism of voice. But when the tenant of its talents were changed, so also was the manifestation of its abilities altered. In the place of the legs to carry it around beautifully were now gone and was the slithering, crawling, painful movement. Instead of ears and eyes to make sense of its environment, it now had to depend on that ugly forked tongue and the vibrations going through the body. Instead of eyes that saw far and wide, they were now buried in scales and it barely groped around. Instead of being the creature that was felt to be friendly and the woman of all creatures could be able to engage friendlily with it. Now, when we see or announce the presence of a snake, immediately what comes to mind is either fight it or flee from it. It's not the choice pet. It's a thing we want to kill. Ladies and gentlemen, that day, when Noah approaches the window and he needs to select the most appropriate creature to send out on this mission, the snake is unavailable. Because over the years, its abilities having been given to the enemy of souls, they have become so degraded that for this crucial mission at hand, yes, it is dark, but the serpent is unavailable. The lesson is not lost to me that as it is with a serpent, so is it with us. Those beautiful feet that God gave you to go on his errands. When given to the work of the devil, when he is done with you, you will be but a crawling version of what God designed you to be. That set of abilities that God gave you to a keen look like wings that made you soar, your voice was soaring, your talent and intellect was soaring, that ability that God gave you for the sole perspective of soaring in his errands 
when seeded to be controlled by the enemy of souls, will not only be plucked off, but when it is all said and done, instead of being a soaring version of you, you will be a crawling, mere version of yourself, trembling at the approach of every vibration coming within your environment. That intellect that God gave you to process information and be able to dispense in whichever domain he has placed you as a light in this world for when it has finally been given to the devil, when he's done with it, what will remain is nothing more but a pale shadow of what you could have become. That voice that spoke both beautifully and convictingly and convincingly, when given over to the devil, ends up being nothing more but a hiss. At times, even literally, what you could sing in the past, you no longer can sing now. What you could speak of with confidence and conviction in the past, again, a sin you can now but hiss. What you could be able to say with authority about God's leading and dealing in your life now has been reduced to nothing more but a hiss. The difference is who is handling your abilities. When Noah stands at that window, he is forever denied the services of the serpent. What once stood in the hierarchy of animals at the topmost is now forever lost to him, not because of any fault on Noah's end, but because of whom the serpent had chosen to use his services. And I pose... As we come to the end of our week together, where we have been asking the question, fill my cup. And I want to finish with this question, who has your cup? If we are asking God to fill our cups, does he have the cup of our lives? As we ask God to fill our cups, are we asking to be filled so that we can continue in his service? Or are we asking for us to be filled so that we can continue in the service of the enemy of souls? As we ask God to fill our cups, could the challenge not be, be not that God is unable to fill it, but because we have allowed ourselves to punch holes in the cups of our souls and now they are dangerously leaking because the enemy of souls is tapping into our cups and anything God could be able to pour, his wisdom, his light, his blessings is quickly hemorrhaging in the service of the enemy of souls. I passed by to end this to remind some fair sister that beauty was given not as an idol to be dangled along, but as something to attract people to the ultimate source of beauty. I pass by to remind some well-sounding brother that voice is not just meant to be thought of as something to give us fame, but it is a tool to be enjoined in the service of the Messiah. I passed by to remind some intelligent one of us that brains are not just to make us be able to earn more money and wield our power over others, but it is a trust given to us so that in an hour of need, God can be able to leverage on us. I read somewhere in prophecy that the waters of the nations are gathering around us. And God, like Noah, wants his children, whom he can depend upon, to have an impact. And my question is, when that time comes, as we approach the closing scenes of the world, will God be able to look and find that that which he invested in us is available? Or 
Will God be able to make that announcement that you have so surrendered your abilities to the devil that they are no longer usable in the service of God? Make no mistake, sin will thrill you, then it will kill you. Sin will fascinate you, then it will assassinate you. The devil will cost you more than you wanted to pay. He will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. He will take you farther than you wanted to go. And when he is done with you, he will use you, then abuse you. Oh, I wish I had the powers to resurrect I would bring before us Ananias and Sapphira and ask them after they had chosen to have their abilities used by the devil, were they promoted? And they will tell you no. No sooner had they sold their souls to the devil than they dropped dead. I wish I had the powers of resurrection. I will bring before us the one called Ishkariot Judas. And ask him after he had used his abilities to procure 30 additional pieces of silver. Did it end with promotion? He will tell you no. In fact the scripture says when he stepped out that night from the presence of Jesus it was dark. Oh I wish I had the powers of resurrection and I'll bring before you Eve and ask her that day as she reached out for the forbidden tree thinking that it was tree good for food and pleasing to the eye and a tree desirable to make one wise did it deliver at the end of the day she will quickly remind you no sooner had we consumed of the fruit having given our abilities to the devil than we realized we were naked I wish I had the ability of resurrection. I'd bring before you Pharaoh and his host of magicians having given themselves entirely to the devil even in the presence of exceeding evidence that God was in control. And I will ask him, did it make sense serving the devil? And he will say, no, I ended with a kingdom in ruin and my own soul and my son were lost at the end of the day. My friends, in 12 quick verses, the serpent moves from the most gifted land animal to perhaps the most hated. The only thing that changes is who he chooses to serve. As it was with him, so can it be with any one of us. We can move from the beautiful, brilliant, promising, individuals we are today to nothing simply because of who we choose to serve. But I thought to end it this way, the loss is not just your own. When Noah releases the dove, he has to release it multiple times. When Noah releases the raven, he has to release it going to and fro. Forgive me, but something tells me the serpent that exceeded all of these things in brilliance. Oh, and I have taken time to study animals. I'm fascinated with a memory of elephants. But the Bible says the serpent outdid it. Something tells me, forgive me for this. That had the serpent been at its peak, it wouldn't need too many trips. This thing would have been wrapped sooner. But Noah has to make do with a raven and with a dove. Why? Because the serpent is lost in the darkness. And look at us today. Our children have to trudge on in life because some father somewhere has given his resources to the service of the devil in the form of an extramarital affair or some secret habit that is leeching the resources. And now that which could have taken a few days has to drag on for years. Look at the church of God. It should be soaring in the world. But some financial guru whom God had called in the church has given his services to the devil and now we limp on financially yet we should be soaring. 
It's not just your life. It's not just your loss. It's not just your dream. We are trying to put together arguments to convince the world. Yet some intellectual guru whom God had brought in the church has given his intellect to the service of self. And now we limp on trying to learn that which we could have learned quickly had you been entirely given to God. No, the loss is not just your own. It's not just your dream you're sacrificing. There are others being impacted by the choice of who is filling and using your cup. I plead with us today. Will God be able to count on you? Will your family and your church and your society be able to count on you? Now the serpent was more subtle than all the creatures of the field. But that now remains as the good old days. And you know that's the religion of quite some number of people. They've experienced nothing new with the Lord, but they can tell you stories of the good old days. Their voice and ability to preach has been given over to the devil and all they can stand today and talk is about the good old days days. That choir has been riddled by all manner of things because its leaders and members gave themselves to the control of the devil and all they can now talk about is the good old days. That institution is a pearl shadow of what it can be but all they can talk is about the good old days. I refuse it to be so. I believe in a God of now and a God of the future. And if anyone gives him his abilities, he is able to still make do with the little abilities of a dove. He is still able to make do with the little abilities of a raven. Yes, the serpents may remain in the darkness, but God is looking for some doves. God is looking for some ravens that will not be as smart or as intelligent as a serpent, but they are ready for deployment in the master's service. Such will God fill their cups. Such will God launch out. Such will still be able to deliver the goods at the end of the day. But it need not always be that way. Even with your great and good abilities given to the hands of the Lord, they still can be able to be great. Now, the serpent used to be more subtle than all the creatures of the field. But God is asking, where are the doves? Where are the ravens? I can deal with them if the serpents don't want me, the choice is yours. Loving Father, prevent some serpents here from going the way of the devil. Help us take seriously the question of in whose service are we? For Lord, in your hands we are filled we are ennobled. In the devil's service, we are degraded. Please, let not the fairness of our circumstances or the largeness of our abilities make us be comfortable in a false sense of security. But loving Father, help us know everything you hold and you control lives to give. And so hold us, control us, that we may live to give. Your word makes it plain that the days ahead of us are days God will need his finest. And Lord, may we be found in that number. Daily consecrate us. Father, I pray for two categories here. Those who may feel like holding back 
because they feel them, they are doves, they, they feel they are ravens, they feel they are small. Help them know, Lord, in your hands, even that which appears small can be effective if consecrated to you. And please, Lord, I pray for the second category, those who know or who already are aware that they are serpents, they have amazing abilities. They have legs, they have wings, they have voice, they have sight, they have ears, both metaphorically and literally. I pray, Lord, they will make the decision not to lend it to the devil, but to be used of you. Fill our cups, Lord, and let them overflow. Fill us until we want no more and have no more room to serve the enemy, but we are given ever, always, only, all for you. Save us from the religion of the good old days. Bring us to our living, daily connection with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.